Next up on your hit parade, we have a video playback from a CFFA 3000 by Chris Kenaway. So I'm going to throw it over there. Hi, I'm Chris Kenaway, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, playing a video from a CFFA 3000 on an Apple II. So this is a project I've been working on for a few months, and it allows playing full screen, double high resolution video uh, together with audio on a standard Apple IIe. And it uses a CFFA 3000 compact flash adapter as the only uh, non-standard component. So this builds on uh, previous work that I've done. Uh, two years ago at KFest, I gave a talk about streaming video via Ethernet, a project called TwoVision. And uh, this year I gave a talk about um, improvements in converting images to display in double high res. So I'm going to talk about how I uh, built this video player. Um, and uh, it's going to be fairly technical. Uh, so if at any point you're bored, uh, then feel free to uh, check out uh, some of the, the sample videos I've posted on the Discord. So I'm not the first person to have uh, uh, worked on Apple II video, of course, um, and there's past work uh, playing videos in, uh, for example, low res, as well as playing black and white videos in high res from a CFA. Uh, the, uh, the famous uh, Bad Apple animation is particularly good for this. And uh, this has even been done uh, from a five and a quarter inch floppy, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but by contrast, um, the approach that I'll be describing allows much higher video bandwidth, uh, enough to do full color double high res video, as well as uh, playing audio at the same time. And it's a fully general uh, video pipeline for transcoding uh, videos from a modern machine to play on the Apple II, either using the CFA or playing via Ethernet using an Ethernet 2. So my starting point for this work was I wanted to really understand how the CFA uh, 3000 works. So what's known about it is that essentially, essentially it implements some standard uh, device driver APIs like SmartPort for performing um, I.O. and emulates a disk two. But otherwise, it's essentially undocumented. And so my guess was that um, the uh, slot firmware is probably using some kind of lower level mechanism to talk to the hardware. And so um, I was wondering, are there opportunities to make use of this to improve the I.O. performance? So I started by reverse engineering the CFA 3000 slot firmware. Uh, it was straightforward to, to dump the, um, the, the slot firmware memory addresses, as well as the extended firmware. And then to reverse engineer the code starting from the, the standard I.O. entry points. And so I was able to, to trace the, the main I.O. command loop. And I found some interesting things. So firstly, it makes no use of the standard I.O. soft switches, which live in, in the C0 page. And instead, all of the I.O. is done via memory addresses in the extended firmware address space, which is the, the CF page. So this means that, so usually this memory on a typical Apple II peripheral is going to be ROM backed, but in our case, for the CFFA, it's actually RAM backed. So that means, for example, you can modify the firmware that's the Apple II sees dynamically at runtime. And it turns out the, the firmware itself makes uh, quite heavy use of this. And so with a bit of work, I was able to, uh, to reverse engineer the, uh, the way that IO is, is uh, performed. And uh, so the first thing is that it uses a, a synchronization protocol between the, the hardware for communicating between the hardware and the, the Apple. And this is essentially a, a shared memory semaphore uh, because the Apple II and the, the onboard hardware um, need to share access to the same memory space. And so they need to coordinate reads and writes. And then the IO is done using a dispatch loop where the, uh, the um, Apple II C of A uh, slot firmware um, issues a, a command to the hardware, and in return, the hardware is going to drive the 6502 through a sequence of operations to, to process that command. And it turns out some of these uh, uh, involve the CFA hardware dynamically modifying the firmware address space that the Apple II sees uh, in order to map in a chunk of code and then direct the 6502 to jump into that code to do something. So that makes it hard to get a complete firmware dump, but fortunately for us, the, the core IO logic is always mapped. And because the uh, the firmware address space is actually writable, uh, 
it was straightforward to, to modify the dispatch loop to record a trace of the operations it was performing just by inserting a jump to my own code, writing out a trace buffer, and then jumping back. And so it turns out that uh, the way uh, read operations are performed is via two steps. Uh, firstly, the C of A tells the, the Apple to copy 512 bytes from the C8 and C9 pages into the caller's requested address buffer. And then it cleans up and returns to the caller. So this means that the C8 and C9 pages in firmware space are actually used as an IO buffer, um, as an intermediate between the, uh, the hardware and the Apple. So from the point of view of the Apple, when it issues a, a block request, a block read request to the C of A, then after some time the contents just magically appear in this uh, 512 byte memory region. And then we copy it from there back into the caller. So copying um, this data into main memory is very slow. Um, the, the fastest we can possibly do is to unroll this loop and then sequentially uh, read a byte from the buffer, write to the target, read the next byte, write to the next target, and so on, 512 times. And this is about 4,000 cycles to do this. But the fact we have access to uh, an internal um, I.O. buffer uh, means that maybe we can actually do, do something uh, better with it. So one thing we could do is to, to write some 6502 code that will access the, the, the contents of the I.O. buffer and then take some action, like writing to screen memory. But the problem is anything we can do is going to be slower than just copying the entire buffer byte by byte, um, blindly. And so if we were to um, use this approach to uh, to try and um, store a double high-res frame copying into the double high-res memory uh, addresses, then the, the best we can do, again, is by fully unrolling this, this loop, and it would take about 123,000 cycles to do that. That works out to about 8.3 frames a second of completely redrawing the entire double high-res high screen, um, ignoring the, the overhead from, from doing the actual disk I.O., which we don't know what that is yet. So that's not terrible. Um, on the other hand, the, um, the, the size of code, the amount of code needed to do this is actually quite large. Um, and so we, we might struggle to fit this in, in memory uh, together with other, other parts of the application. So can we do uh, better than this? Well, we know we can't read from the, the buffer faster than, than this under 6502 program control. But the 6502 itself can access the buffer faster by executing from it. So, for example, we can load 512 bytes of code into the I.O. buffer and then jump to it. And so we can do um, use this approach to do, do better. For example, we don't need to worry about loading a value from memory. We can just load the value directly. Uh, we can place the value into the buffer so that we load it. And then we don't have to store, we can store the same value in multiple locations without having to, to refetch it in between. And these don't even have to be contiguous in memory. So this approach turns out to be about twice as fast in, in the, the best case than the previous approach of, of just copying sequentially uh, into memory. But the downside is about three, it takes about three times as much space to, to represent the same number of, uh, of screen bytes. Uh, on average, um, 512 bytes of this kind of code is going to take something like 650 cycles to execute. So the question is, is this better than the previous approach? So in order to understand this, we need to look at the, the timings involved in the, the read sequence. So at the top here, we have the uh, what the 6502 um, firmware is going to be doing, and down here is what the hardware is doing. So uh, to start with, we need to issue the, the read block command to the C of A. And so this is going to do a few things in response to that. Um, it turns out it will unmap the, the contents of the, uh, of the previous I.O. buffer. And then it will begin trying to map in the, the, the new block from, from cache or loading it from disk if it's not already cached. And in the best case where this is, is already cached um, previously, it takes about 300 cycles to, to, to map. Uh, in the meantime, we don't have access to the, the buffer anymore, so uh, we may not be able to do 
um, very much. We may just have to busy wait on, on until it's ready. Uh, but um, once the, the new block is mapped, then the C of A tells us that it's ready, and it, it tells us that we should execute command number five, uh, which is a particular command in the um, the Apple II um, C of A slot firmware. Uh, and ordinarily, this, this, this command number five is is what what tells uh, tells it to to copy the the contents back to the caller's buffer. But if we're doing our own thing, we're free to ignore that and and just do what we like. Um, we first have to acknowledge the the read though. And in response to that, the, the C of A is going to begin prefetching the, the next block, um, the sequentially next block on disk. Uh, while this is happening, we're free to, to do what we like with the buffer, and so we can jump to it and begin executing the contents. And as we saw, this is going to take about 650 cycles um, to complete. In the meantime, it turns out the, the prefetching, um, at least for a, a compact flash um, uh, card, in my case at least, it's taking about 600 cycles to complete. Uh, USB media is much, much slower than this, uh, but, but Compact Flash is fast. And so when this is done, we again will signal that to the Apple that, that we're ready and we'll tell it to execute command number one, uh, which turns out to be the one that would um, clean up and exit to the caller if we were listening to it. But so one thing we notice here is that by the time we finished executing our buffer, the C of A will usually have just finished um, prefetching the next block. And so we've overlapped these um, uh, these two operations and um, the next block is already there when we need it. So ordinarily in the, the C of A firmware, um, we would acknowledge the the, the um, completion of this command and then exit and return to the, to the caller. Uh, but here we're free to just um, begin fetching the next block in a loop and starting again. So one way to look at this um, uh, this technique is that it allows us to execute um, up to two terabytes of 6502 code, which is um, the maximum addressable via the underlying um, smart port APIs that it uses. Uh, and this is paged in 512 byte chunks into memory, uh, but um, we can execute at about two thirds of native CPU speed, um, about 650 cycles was useful work with about 300 cycles of overhead, um, but this is um, you know, essentially it's very close to main memory speed, even though we're paging it in dynamically from from Compact Flash. Uh, and it turns out this um, we're able to read the data from read and map in the data um, into memory at about 533 kilobytes per second, at least on on my my hardware, uh, which is about seven times faster than the the usual smart port API. So let's come back to using this to, to play videos. Uh, so it turns out that using this approach, you can um, get something like 9.4 full um, redraws of a double high-res screen per second. And this is uh, slightly better than the the, the, um, the full frame update approach we looked at before, which was some something less than eight, eight updates per second. So in the worst case, this is, this is better than the previous approach. And on average, it's much better because most videos aren't going to change every pixel, every frame, and we can change as many or as few as we like. And we're also free to do other things as well while we're processing, like maybe toggle the speaker. Uh, producing um, speaker audio um, requires exact cycle countings. So this this could get tricky, but uh, in principle it can work. So our strategy for, for rendering uh, videos um, is essentially to unroll the video into uh, straight line 6502 code, so no jumps, no conditionals, just um, sequential loads and stores, um, such that when the, this program is executed, it will update the screen memory and manage display switches and cause the video to be rendered. At the same time, if we want to, uh, to also um, be doing audio, then we need to be toggling the speaker at exact cycle timings um, while we're doing this. And so this 6502 code is going to be packaged into 512 byte chunks, and these will be paged in together, um, paged together with the I/O code we looked at. And because the um, the code is being um, loaded and executed at about 500 kilobytes per second, these video files are going to be quite large, about 30 megs per minute. And ordinarily, this, this would be a problem, but here we're using a compact flash device, and it's got gigabytes of storage to, to spare, so this is not actually a problem for us. 
uh, but so in, it, to summarize, we, we just need to write the world's largest 6502 program. So of course we wouldn't do this by hand, we would want to generate this code. And it turns out I already wrote most of this program back in 2019. Um, my uh, Ethernet 2 video player um, knows how to do things like multiplexing a, a video and an audio stream into a native Apple II format, uh, knows how to encode pulse width modulated audio, and understands the uh, memory structure of uh, Apple II graphics, and how to encode um, image frames from the video into double high res, and it knows how to do um, to uh, to look at the, the deltas between um, video frames, and then to prioritize um, sending the, the the bytes that will make the largest visual difference to the image, uh, in case we don't have enough time to completely send every single change. So essentially, I just needed to swap out the output representation of of, of this to use generated 6502 code instead of a, a bytecode representation. And in the meantime, I'd also um, built this, this other program, 2Pix, um, which has a um, produces higher quality uh, double high-res image encoding. And so I swapped out the, the image encoding as well. So some of the tricky parts are to do with handling audio. Uh, as I mentioned, um, this, this requires tolling this, the speaker at exact um, cycle uh, counts. So in other words, to produce the, the video stream, we need to interleave, interleave um, some code that looks like this, where we have some speaker access, and then some uh, some delay, and then a speaker access again on, on a very particular cycle number. And on the video side, um, we have some, some loads and stores, uh, and we want to interleave these, something like this, where we, we try and um, uh, fill as much as possible of the, the gaps in between these fixed um, fixed cycle numbers. Uh, and sometimes have to include some padding when, when they don't fit. And so I wrote some code that, that can uh, interleave these kinds of upgrade streams and, and produce the, the, the output. Um, as a bonus, um, this way of doing uh, the sort of unrolled version of the audio playback um, lets us give uh, get better audio quality than we would if we were playing back from memory. Um, and from a, a in-memory playback, uh, it turns out you can't fetch the samples quickly enough from memory to be able to play audio at 22 kilohertz. And what you'd usually do is use a lower bitrate sample and then play it twice. Uh, but here, because we can just directly uh, compile the, the set of um, uh, the speaker timings, we can actually uh, play back at, at 20 kilohertz. There's a caveat, which is that we need to work out how to keep playing the audio during the period of 300 cycles when um, the, our, our buffer is unmapped and we're doing I, managing the I.O. to the C of A. So the approach that, that turned out to work here is to, um, to queue up samples ahead of time so that we can then fetch them and play them during this I.O. period. So we push the samples onto the stack and then the I.O. code, um, I needed to carve it up into segments of about 100 cycles each and then for each of these segments, generate 50 different variants of, of, of the same code, which does the same basic operation, but also toggling the speaker at, at some definite um, uh, frequency, so every every n cycles. And each of these code segments needs to not only drive the C of A I/O, but it needs to worry about fetching the next audio sample and then chaining to the next I/O segment, according to which sample that is. Uh, but this is essentially the same code interleaving problem we just had. Um, we need to interleave some arbitrary 6502 code with uh, the speaker modulation. Uh, and so the same approach worked there. Uh, the caveat is because we're fetching these samples from memory, we have to use the, um, the lower bitrate sampling and then play them back twice, like we usually would. Uh, this turns out to add some overhead as well because we have to, to pad the, um, the, the speaker timings and we have a bit more work to do as well. And so the overhead of doing the I.O. management is about 450 cycles instead of 300. Uh, but it all works and uh, we get uh, uh, good quality audio together with the video playback. So there's a few things I, I wish I'd, um, I'd learned earlier um, when I was doing this project. Uh, one of them is that um, when you were uh, trying to understand hardware, you should actually look at the hardware, um, not just look at the, the, the software. 
Uh, I'm a software guy, so um, that's my sort of first inclination is to, to dive in and look at the um, look at the code. And I was able to reverse engineer the um, I/O protocols that the hardware uses. Um, but in the end, it turns out a lot of this was actually written in the data sheets for some of the components. So the lesson here is that um, modern Apple II hardware design um, makes a lot of use of, of standard off-the-shelf components that are sort of glued together to perform um, large amounts of functionality. Uh, whereas back in the day, this would have been custom logic. And these off-the-shelf components are usually pretty well documented. You can just download the, the data sheets from the internet. And moreover, they're usually exposed in some way to the Apple II. Um, either directly or, or um, at least influencing the design of the, the what's exposed so you can understand the internals. Uh, the other thing I, I learned was a, a, a neat trick for um, measuring timing loops, which is to um, toggle the speaker in your timing loop, and then you can uh, measure the frequency just by, um, well, using a smartphone app and um, measuring the audio frequency. Uh, this is how I did the, the throughput measurements, for example, of the I.O. Uh, loop. Uh, it also lets you hear it quite easily if there's any sort of cycle non-exactness. Non um, you just don't hear a, um, a pure tone. Um, I ran into a couple of interesting bugs in the C5A firmware um, while I was uh, working on this. Um, neither of them are going to affect the usual operation of the C5A. Um, it's just going to doing crazy things with it that, that I tripped over them. Uh, one of them is that it turns out that um, reading, uh, at least on the Apple IIe um, firmware, uh, reading beyond 32 megabytes doesn't work right. And this isn't ordinarily a problem because ProDOS doesn't support larger than 32 megabyte volumes, but in theory, SmartPort should let me uh, read up to 8 gigabytes. Uh, and so Dave Lyons, um, who wrote the firmware, um, um, suggested a workaround, which is to, to dispatch to the underlying hardware um, the extended SmartPort commands that um, the 2GS firmware would use, um, even though the 2E firmware doesn't support them. Uh, the other weird thing I found is that um, writing to certain memory locations would then cause nearby reads to become corrupted. Uh, and again, this is not something that the, the, the card itself would ever do, uh, And but I'm not sure what's going on here, um, a timing issue or something wrong with my board. Uh, so next steps, um, I need to finish cleaning up the, the code and merging it back into the, the main 2Vision repository. Um, the current version um, only runs on the 2E. Uh, the C of A firmware is different on the 2GS. Um, it's hopefully just a matter of some different entry points uh, and, and it should be minor to, to fix. I've started poking a bit at um, what's possible on other mass storage devices like the Booty. Um, the Microdrive Turbo might be interesting to look at as well, but I don't actually have one at the moment. Uh, and it'd be very interesting to see if there's uh, any other interesting applications for this page page code technique that, that I was describing. Um, for example, it should be possible possible to to write some pretty cool demos that use up to two terabytes of six five zero two speed code. Uh, so at some point, hopefully not um, too long, um, the the code will appear at this um, GitHub repository. And uh, here's a link to, to a Dropbox that has um, uh, some of the video files you can download and, and try out for yourself. Uh, I've also posted uh, a link to, to this and uh, to some of the um, to some YouTube videos on the Discord, so you can check it out for yourself. Okay, uh, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, yeah, so, so a couple. I know you've um, been you've been answering some of them definitely. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, would something like Dragon Slayer or other LD games be with keyboard and joystick input be possible? Yeah, it's a really interesting idea. Um, I think it should be. Uh, one one issue with this approach is that there's limited opportunities for sort of doing conditional logic, you know, making decisions and and changing things on the fly. But something like um, like Dragon's Lair, where, where it's essentially um, very simple decision points and then loading in a different video stream, uh, that should work quite well. You could, you know, check a key press um, in in the I/O path, and then um, based on that, you know, switch to a different um, seek to a different block, and then keep going from there. Uh, so yeah, that, that seems like that would work pretty well. Um, obviously, somebody's, somebody's got to you know build the the game and and you know the the video sequence and so on. Uh, but, but yeah, that, that, that approach is a good idea. 
can I post a link to a YouTube video? Absolutely. Yep, I'll, I'll do that. Um, they're in the Discord channel, um, but I'll also drop some in here. Uh, there's also questions on Discord about uh, in the video encoding, do I use any kind of psychovisual psychovisual encoding to um, avoid to, to choose which which parts of the video are the most important ones to send? Um, the answer is sort of. Um, I do attempt to um, not do sort of psychovisual modeling uh, very sophisticatedly, but um, I look at which bytes have changed and then um, try to pick which which byte I should send that will change the, the target frame by the most. Um, and it's not a very sophisticated approach. Uh, and I probably should uh, learn more about like other approaches in, in modern video um, encoding. Um, but you know, it does some attempt there. I think there's, there's quite a bit of room for improvement in, in that, uh, that algorithm though. Um, I'll also post the Dropbox link. Yep, thanks for that reminder. Um, Let's see. Let me get back to the right screen here. Uh, I wonder how much this could faster this could be in the two GS. Um, I think unfortunately the answer is not faster because it's executing from the uh, C the the C thousand um, pages, uh, and I think those are always slowed down to one megahertz. Um, is my understanding. I don't really know much about the 2GS, but uh, I think just in general, you know, because it has to inter interface with legacy hardware, um, it's probably not going to be able to uh, do that at full speed. Um, there, having said that, you can probably do something with 16-bit um, instructions, which may be uh, a good trick. Um, yeah. I, See, somebody has made a suggestion. So uh, I'm by no means a TGS expert. So yeah, if anyone is inspired by this, then then uh, yeah, I'll be happy to to help out to to, to try it out. Uh, and yeah, Martin's saying, let's see if they sort of works in the Apple three, uh, and maybe uh, it could be a bit faster there as well, which I don't know even less about. So well, they're more more after Paul's talk today. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? How long does compression take? Ah, um, it's it's quite slow. Um, uh, so roughly um, on the order of a day per minute. Um, th this is um, largely um, the so the code the uh, the encoding is is done done in Python, uh, and it's somewhat optimized. But uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, and yeah, I. I probably should spend some time on that. Um, yeah, so uh, by no means uh, a real-time pipeline here. That should be possible to speed up by you know, several orders of magnitude if, uh, if I was to rewrite that. OK. Um, so we're just about out of time, so I think we're going to uh, move this dis move this discussion down to the discourse. If you have any questions for Chris, uh, feel free to post them in the channel.